for those of you not in Canada, we're on Vancouver Island, British Columbia, Canada, and I'm at a gallery called Rainforest Arts in beautiful downtown Chimanus. Normally, if there wasn't a pandemic on, Chimanus and the rest of the, uh, the gallery and the rest of Chimanus would be open and bustling because they have, uh, it's quite a tourist spot in the summer. They have a theater and they have uh, the entire town painted with murals. There you go. Martin's going to show the rest of the gallery while we're finishing getting set up here. So, but since this is a pandemic, the theater is closed. Uh, but a lot of the rest of the businesses are open in Shimana. So if you are doing a staycation kind of a last minute, last, the end of summer kind of staycation, you know, you can still come through Shimana and there's still quite a few businesses open, restaurants, galleries, a couple of antique stores. It's a really fun, it's a fun little special spot uh, to come and uh, hang out for an afternoon or a day. And and yeah, the gallery is closed today, which is why we're not wearing masks. There's going to be no one coming in and out. So we feel all safe and secure that way. Uh, normally, the gallery is open Wednesday to Saturday, 11 to 4. And they do ask that you do wear a mask. Um, and this is, this is the featured artist space in the gallery. And uh, I've had my work up here since... Oh, let's see, since August, since the end of August, what, what, blow October, what month is it? Yeah, so beginning of August, and it'll be on until September 26th. And I, what I want to do is just walk you through the show and the pieces because um, there is no opening, there is no artist talk, and so this is the safest way that we could do this, and I could show you some of the pieces in the show and you can just lounge in your living room in your pajamas and see my work so and ask questions if they want to please ask questions as we go martin will be martin will be uh relaying the questions to me so if you have them um at any time just just toss them out we'll see how that goes so i'm going to start with these pieces these pieces i call the copper vein series and what i'll do is i'll just bring it right up to the camera at first so you can get a good sense of what's going on here. How's that, can you see? These pieces are made with contorted hazel, which is a common garden tree, and this is a Virginia creeper, is the weavers. And I'm just gonna turn this around slowly so you can get a sense of the size and the scale of this. And Virginia creeper is also a fairly common garden plant around here. So I harvest all of these pieces uh, myself and then I take them home to my studio and I'll make these pieces. So what I'll do is I'll just show, I'm gonna show you now the uh, raw material just to give you a sense of what I start with. I'm not gonna do this for every single piece in the show that would be really dull, but I wanna give the people who don't really have a lot of understanding about basketry, a sense of what goes into making these pieces. So this is the raw material of Virginia creeper. And so what I do is I go out and I collect this in the fall or in the winter when all the leaves have come off of it. And if you're familiar with Virginia creeper at all, a lot of times you'll see it and it'll be really, uh, really old, really gnarly. You've seen it maybe on the sides of buildings. It's the one that goes really, really bright red in the fall. It has these super, super beautiful bright red leaves. And that's, that's Virginia creeper as well. But what this is, is a spot that I found where the long runners grow actually over a, a six foot high wall. So it's like a waterfall cascade of these beautiful long straight runners of Virginia creeper. And for a basket weaver, something like that is gold because what you want is long thin runners like that. It sounds like there's a question. Couple, no, a couple of comments. T.L. Houston Art with Heart says beautiful piece. And Sarina Lobo says, love that you're showing the raw materials. Hi, Sarina. Also, Dion Vilens says, does it not break when you harvest it? Excellent question. 
when you harvest it, it's fresh. So it would be uh, like harvesting any other kind of a fresh vine. It's very pliable, it's alive, it's full of water. What I do at that point is circle, is, um, well, circle it up like this and let it dry. So it needs to dry for not too long, maybe a month or so. Um, once it's dry, then I work with it by soaking it first. What I found with Virginia creeper is it works really well if you steam it. So what I have at home is this really fabulous, uh, it's actually canning water bath, an electric water bath. So I can heat up a small amount of water in the bottom and let that steam build up and put these coils in it, stack these coils up. So I'm actually using very little water, which is great. And the warm water and the steam just gets this material beautifully pliable. And at that point, it's, a, it's an absolute dream to work with. Because as you can see, I'll just grab a different piece. Because as you can see, the material needs to wrap right around the very edge of these branches. So I'm really, I'm pulling like a 180 and further around some of these branches as that. <laughs> so once this material has been steamed, it's, it's able to do this. And if, it, if I don't treat it that way, uh, often I find it will snap, but the steam just makes it beautifully pliable. And that's the backside. Now, once I get to this point, it's really just a very simple over and under. Uh, this is called a rib basket construction, if you're curious about that style. And I've got four pieces in the show that are done in this style. I'll just show the other two uh, quick here. There's a little mini guy, and that has the copper guild. I'll talk about that in just a second. And then there's this big, beautiful piece, one of the biggest pieces in the show. And this one, I'll talk about the copper gilding that I do now. Um, you'll notice that all of those pieces have a couple of, uh, well, this one has two of the, of the um, branches that are covered in copper. And that's basically the, how's that better? It's a, sort of a historical technique. It is a historical technique. And you can think about what's called gilding or gilt, metallic gilt, G-I-L-T. I was misspelling it in my Instagram page for a long time, so I'm trying to get that right now. And that is a technique where very thin, micro-thin sheets of metal are, are used to be beaten out by hand. I'm sure it's done by machine now. And I take the copper, very thin sheets of pure copper, and apply them to these branches uh, with a adhesive, layer by layer by layer, build it up so it looks beautiful and then let that dry and then um, put a finish on top of the whole thing. And, you know, partly um, I love the way it looks, just straight up, I think it's a really beautiful way to highlight some of the beautiful squiggly branches. Oh, Martin's gonna hold that for me, that's great. And partly I'm really interested in the, uh, the kind of the history of um, metallic gilding uh, traditionally, it was used in religious manuscripts. Um, you may have heard of the phrase illuminated manuscripts, and it was used to add light or illuminate the actual pages of the manuscripts and historically. And of course, these were more like religious, they were religious texts for the most part, or parables. Uh, I think it's really... I like to think about the idea of what we hold sacred these days. And what do we hold up and exalt as, as sacred or as precious? And those are the kind of ideas I'm playing with by drawing attention to these kind of a detail. Why, you know, why can't we hold up and exalt a perfect, beautiful, squiggly branch? 
And this one, this one's called Strikes Twice uh, because it reminded me of lightning. Oh, one other thing. I wanted to, I forgot one thing I wanted to show, which was, could you see the little stone in there? It's another little detail I like to put in some of my baskets. Can you? And that is, uh, uh, when you're walking in the woods and you see a tree that has fallen down and the roots are exposed, and a lot of times you'll see the roots growing around stones that have then been brought up because the, uh, the tree has fallen over. And I just, I love the way the roots grow around the stones. So you'll see that in a few of my baskets. So yeah, if there's any questions at all, I'm happy to answer them as we go. It gives me a sense of uh, what people are interested in and what they want to know about. And oh, I'll just show you one more. It's a similar, similar little guy, but it has a different, um, different weavers. And this is this one's made from again the contorted hazel. And but the material that I've used as the weavers is our native trailing blackberry vine. So I'll, I will go out in the fall and harvest these blackberry vines. Uh, a friend of mine calls them trip berry. So you might be familiar with those long vines that like to grow over the trails and will trip you. But in the fall, they turn this really beautiful russet color and that's what this one is made out of. That's that little guy. You get, you're getting some lovely compliments on your work. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, but no questions okay. at the moment. All right. No questions is fine, um, but I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs> oh, and then the, just the last uh, thing I wanted to mention about the Copper Vein series is I do have a different piece in this series on display in Vancouver right now. Uh, sorry, no, it, open, it opens September 10th. It's a Craft Council of BC show called Personal, material Geo Personal and Material Geographies. Looks like a really interesting show. I won't be making it to the opening, unfortunately, for that. But it is on from September 10th till December 11th, and it's at the Italian Cultural Center. I have two questions. Great. One from either Pascaline Bars or Pascalina Bars. At what stage do you put the hazel in, same time as the ribs? Question mark. Pretty much yes. What you're doing is creating an armature. So what I will start with in these pieces, often I will start pretty much with the with the frame with the rim with the rim. So I will find two pieces that go together. You, you can see there's one branch coming out this way, and one coming out this way. So often what I will do is find those two forks and build them together like that. If you can imagine that's the branch that way, and that's the branch that way. I sort of weave the squiggly bits together to create a rim. And at that point, I will start bending the ribs into place. Um, you'll have to start at either end with sort of what's called a, a god's eye, kind of a, <coughs> excuse me, kind of a weave to create the pockets to put in the ribs. Does that make sense? Okay, another question that came up was, do you use the contorted hazel fresh so you can manipulate it, or do you do the same process of drying and rehydrating? A bit of both. Mostly with the contorted hazel, I'm, I'm creating the, the rim fresh because or like sort of like half dry i will cut the hazel and then let it sit outside for maybe a month um, depending on the weather if it sits in the hot dry sun it's going to dry out very quickly if it sits in the cool shade it will still be pliable after even a couple of months even longer so at that point as long as it's still a little bit pliable i'm creating and bending the thin little bits around each other and then a lot of times after I make the frame like that, that will sit inside my studio for another two or three weeks, letting it shrink even more. With, with fairly woody material like this, 
in a, in a loose kind of a structure like this, it's not as important to let it dry 100% completely as you would have to do with something like a willow construction because I can still work with it and it is somewhat sculptural. Um, so it's okay if it shrinks a little bit after I've made the frame. Another question which you may be getting into with the other, other stuff is, um, so you weave with different natural materials, you find stroke harvest in autumn, winter, do you also weave with other materials? And I think you're probably gonna... Right, because the, the, what I've mentioned so far is harvesting in the autumn and the winter. And yes, um, there's a whole world of natural materials and harvest times, different times to harvest those natural materials. And definitely uh, autumn is one of them because it's just a natural cycle where the plant has gone through its life cycle, lost its leaves. That's fairly important for a lot of basketry material. You don't want to be weaving with all the leaves on it. So harvesting in, at any time from in November, December, January, February is a, is a great time if you want just the material without the leaves on it. It's also a good time to harvest things like daylily leaves when they've gone through the life cycle and died back. So daylily leaves, iris leaves, stuff like that. Maybe for something like a uh, cattail in the middle of summer, you want the, you want the big beautiful green leaves, you'll want to harvest that in the middle of summer. So it depends on the material because every different every material has a different peak time that you want to harvest it. And there's a whole uh, there's a whole book that I could recommend on um, when to harvest different materials in the Pacific Northwest. And the best thing to do because it's actually a bit hard to find, I call it my Bible, uh, is message me. Either message me or shoot me an email through. Uh, my website and I will send you a link to that book because it can it's actually a little bit difficult to find a lot of a lot of basket weaving is still a little bit old school I have two more questions but I also want to let you know that our old neighbor from Courtney just popped up on, on as well so hi Maura, hi, Maura. Um, <laughs> so Diana asks at what point do you decide how big your pieces are going to be good question wow uh, at what point In, in general, over, overall right now, I'm working a little bit larger because I can, and, I, and I'm really aware of this because a lot of the pieces, and I'll just, let me just see what I had actually next. Oh yeah, here we go, perfect. Um, this one, for example, it's big. And I, and, I, and I had the idea that I wanted to make a big piece and I'm really aware of the physicality of this kind of stuff because I, I, like I'm 51, I'm starting to get older and I'm not always going to physically be able to make a large basket like this. So right now I'm diving into kind of the big stuff. Um, and that's just sort of a kind of a maybe slightly morbid life attitude, but I, I feel like, you know, kind of seize the day when you can, I'm not always going to be able to make something like this. Um, so I would say at the outset. What, why, why are you not gonna be able to make things like this? Just oh, the oh, physical strength? Physical strength, um, potentially arthritis down the road. My hands are starting to get a little bit stiff. My, hand, my shoulders, my back, my hands will be very sore after working on this for, all, for an entire afternoon. Um, so at what point do I decide how big things are going to be? Ooh, uh, gravity. Um, Definitely, you have to have something in mind at the outset for something like this. It depends on how much material I have available to me as well. For this, I was begging for wisteria for, oh God, for two seasons. So people usually trim their wisteria in, uh, they, either, they either trim it in the fall or they trim it sort of really, really, really early spring before it started to bud out. So this was made over two seasons where I was poking people going, can I come trim your wisteria? Can I come trim your wisteria? Because there was a ton of material in here. Almost swore, didn't do it. <laughs> there is a ton of material in here. Um, if that answers that question, I can talk more about this piece. Okay. Someone wants to know how, how sorry, someone, Zarina wants to know how heavy is that huge basket? Less than five pounds. Uh, more than two. 
probably between three and four pounds. Because uh, when it dries, it's fairly light. All of this is dried material. I know you also you you also said that that book recommend you would you would let people know if they message you. Is there any way you can just say what the title of the book is? Uh, yes, but you probably won't find it on you won't find it anywhere except where I tell you to find it. It's it's just I think it's called I think it's called Basketry Materials of the Pacific Northwest, and it's just a small paper Sirlox bound book that a few of the uh, ladies from the Northwest Basket Weavers Association Guild in Washington put out and I believe there's only two places you can actually buy it and both of those are uh, personal websites of people that I know. Um, but, but the um, one of the websites is oh what is it called Earthwalk. If you look on Instagram for I believe they're called Earthwalk and they're in the Pacific Northwest. They should carry it on their website. I may have that wrong and that's why I wanted to say just message me and I can send you the direct link. Um, yeah. Lots of people joining from lots of different places that I don't know. Oh, that's exciting. Thanks everyone. Uh, so this, yeah, this is one of the largest pieces-ish in the show. Yeah, that, that's a bigger one. And it's all made out of wisteria. And again, I will uh, bother people and poke people and beg people to come and trim their wisteria. Most of this has bark on. The white pieces is peeled wisteria. So any time you see the white vine in there, that is where I have gone to the trouble of peeling the bark off of the wisteria. And I just really like the contrast. And this is a uh, random weave basket. And that, that, that title kind of pretty much just sums up the style, random weave. And it takes a very long time and it takes a lot of material. Jill Green says, Earthwalk is correct. Thank you, Jill. And Claudia says, hello, even from Germany. Oh, Claudia. Oh, that's amazing. So there's this piece. And then I have a smaller version of this. Oh yeah, how are we doing on time? Uh, I think as long as people want to stick around, we're, we, we, we're probably only, we said we'd go for half an hour, we've yeah. got like five minutes left, but if you want to keep oh, going, wow. it okay. seems that people, uh, people will stick around until they don't. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, wow, I can't believe that went by so fast. I just wanted to show you, here's the other one. I'll speed up a little bit. It's the same, it's just a smaller version of the one I just showed you. And I did have a reason. Okay, so just moving on to the willow pieces now. We'll start with this one. Um, we just had a comment that from Frigid Factory who says she loves you, and she says, I'm here forever. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Frigid. Coming to us from Edmonton, probably, or somewhere. Great to see you. I uh, know, you can't, I can't see you. You see me. Pat Hi. Karen says, go longer. <laughs> Karen. So here, this one is made out of willow, and willow is like a whole other, I could talk for a whole hour about willow. I won't. Um, oh, it smells so good. It still smells so good. This is a random weave um, based on a hen basket style, and, and the hen basket just refers to the fact that you would take your hen to the market in a basket like this, except this is a modern updated version, and you probably wouldn't do a random weave to take your hen to the market. Although you could, it's that strong. Um, the interesting thing about willow is this is actually made with willow. Yeah, this is made with willow that actually was shipped over from England, if you can believe that. I didn't order this willow. I have a friend who is a weaver who ordered a pallet of willow, and I bought some from her. The reason for that is willow is difficult to get your hands on uh, around here unless you go and harvest it yourself which I also do. And this one is made out of wild willow. So you see the difference in the color? I mean, willow comes in all sorts of different colors. This one has a driftwood handle. And it is a random weave as well. Different style of random weave, I would say as done in sort of a swirling kind of style. And that's the driftwood handle. But all of this is 
uh, wild harvested willow, what I affectionately call ditch willow, and I, I get most of it uh, up in Courtney. Uh, we used to live there for a couple of years, <coughs> and so I'd have all my harvesting spots up there in the uh, irrigation ditches, or actually just the ditches on the side of the road, and, it, and the city, what happens is a city comes along and cuts them back every year, and so it grows up beautiful, t tall and straight up there. Was there a question? Um, there was, as Irina says, do you feel like you know by now how much material you need for an idea you have, or do you go with what you have harvested? Um, it's a bit of it's a bit of both. If I have a project in mind, the thing that basketry has taught me, my big takeaway from the sort of artistic practice end of it is patience and planning. So if I have something in mind that I want to make, I have I have wanted to make this basket for probably three years, and I needed to wait, well until I figured out how to make it. But I needed to wait until I had enough willow harvested in order to kind of be able to waste a whole bunch of willow figuring this out. So I probably, there's probably about 150 rods, it's what you call the willow sticks, in this basket, but I, I wanted to have more like three or four hundred because I knew I'd mess up, if that answers your question. Karen asks, uh, do you make any framework for random weaves or completely random? Yes, framework. You're always making an armature over which to over which to put everything else. This, when I was making it, looked terrible until it was about 90% done. It looked hideous. And then all of a sudden it comes together because you just keep covering it up, covering it up, swirling and covering until you co cover the armature. But the process to get to that point um, is very depressing because it looks terrible. <coughs> we also have Micah from the Netherlands who came in. So, hi. So, uh, oh yeah, hi. And this is the third willow piece and it's done in a very different style. This was a very much inspired by an Irish basket maker named Joe Hogan. And he does, um, he, he has a history of traditional Irish basket making, but then he, uses that as a leapfrog into these amazing sculptural pieces and he's he's just uh, off the charts amazing he grows his own willow in ireland and so this goes back to that rib basket construction so you can see where i started with this was again with that frame and then what i've done a la joe hogan is let me just see if i can find it here i've drilled into I don't make you seasick here. I've drilled into some spots in the driftwood, and that's where the, thanks Martin, and that is where I have started to attach some of the ribs, and I like drilled and glued. Okay. And so once I've drilled and glued some of the ribs, I can start weaving, and as I weave, I can add the rest of the ribs, and that is, this is all cultivated willow, it's not wild willow. And that's, that's the only thing with, with the wild willow. It works well, I think, for something like, like that random weave one, but you never really know how it's gonna behave as opposed to the cultivated willow. Some of this cultivated willow I buy from a fellow who grows it in Courtney. I can buy small amounts from him and he's great. One of the questions was what did you use for gluing? Oh, wood glue. Yeah, just wood glue because the driftwood is wood and the willow, once it's dry, is, is essentially wood. So just a good, strong wood glue works really well. Um, oh, okay. And then actually that's, that's it except for the pieces up on the walls. I could talk about these. Can you see these? Uh, I can see that one better than this one. This one? Yeah. Okay. You can also bring it down. Yeah, I suppose I could, couldn't I? It's just on a nail, I yeah, think. Yeah, it is. Okay, so these wall hangings are made, they're very, very light, and they are made out of peeled maple saplings and peeled willow. So I will harvest these branches in the spring when the sap is running. 
and then I will pull the bark off of it and that and it's just this is the all natural color some people think it's painted but this is all natural color underneath of the branches and again you have to do that in the spring uh, when the sap is running and then this the weaver material how's that can you see mm -hmm. this is all peeled English ivy so English ivy where we live in British Columbia is considered an invasive species uh, so everyone's very happy if you want to come and pull English ivy from their garden I have a couple of different spots where I like to go and pull it um, you don't want to be pulling it off of off of when it's growing on trees because you can accidentally strip the bark off of the trees and and that will kill the tree and you I, what I'm looking for is I don't really want to thank you I don't really want to pull it from um, where it's growing over a wall or where it's gone really zigzaggy what I'm what I'm looking for for these pieces are very long runs of at least uh, 10 feet like 10 to 20 to 30 feet long is what I'm what I'm gathering when I'm gathering the wild willow sorry English ivy I actually made a, a series of videos just recently and you can find those on my Instagram Where did it look? yes I've started a YouTube channel and I've gone through if you're interested in how to harvest English ivy I take you through kind of step by step of how to do that to get down to this beautiful fine material right here and this was sort of my way my response to trying to find a different material other than the commercially available cane or reed it's also known as um, which is great if you're if you're learning basketry you pretty much learn on uh, reed or cane um, but I was trying to find something that's not imported from overseas and we have tons of English ivy completely different look in a lot of ways but I, I'm really happy with what I can get down to with the English ivy their question no this is a comment from Jill Green though who says re natural material grounds for gathering basketry basketry plants west of the Cascades <laughs> by Patricia Pinson Reese and Wilma Zoe Ziegler and a link in there to the Earthwalk Northwest store. So uh, if you all want to go down to the comments, you'll find that link in there. Thank you for doing that, Jill. That's perfect. Uh, fine, fine artisanry said, I've been fascinated by the cordage you make. Uh, do you ever use cordage for making baskets? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I love making cordage. It is, I'm just going to put this back on the wall so that I can not break it. That would be, that would be bad. Um, there just isn't a lot of cordage in this show because it's, it, the, the show is a, a general theme of, uh, well, it's called Wild Works, and so I wanted to keep it a lot more loose, and, uh, but I definitely do use cordage in, uh, I have some long, very long rib baskets that I make that are probably three to four feet, feet long, and I will use cordage as, we, as a weaver. So, so I can make cordage for, you can, as you know, make cordage for miles and miles and miles. And I will take that material and then thread it through uh, the ribs and use that as a, um, as a weaver. And there just is, isn't any in this show. But uh, yeah, I love making cordage. I can make it for hours. Or braids. I could braid for hours with material. Um, iris leaves, yellow flag iris, daylily leaves. You can just make your own yardage and yardage of material. And I, I love doing that as well. It's a good winter activity. Uh, one question I can answer, which is, is your YouTube channel under the same name? Yes, it's under the name of Christy York. Yes, it is. Yeah, thank you. And the last piece in the show, can you see? Uh, yeah. No, I can't take it down, actually. Okay. I should have thought of that. All right, I'll move it's the camera. It's a bit difficult. OK. Great. This is made out of grapevines. And it is a very large um, platter, but it, it's really a wall hanging. Um, and it's made out of grapevines. And the way I made this piece is, well, begging grapevines from other people, because we don't have grapevines, but that most people are quite happy to let you come and uh, cut down their overgrown grapevine. And the way this again was another piece that was made over over a year because it was over two seasons of grapevine harvesting. So I harvested some in the fall and made these by if you can imagine a long grapevine where it forks. So imagine the forks 
coming together like that. I stuck a bunch of forks together all the way around here so that these were the ends of the vines coming out and the forks creating that armature again. The forks were all together created a big armature. And I had that for, for one season, or I guess like half a season, hanging on my wall. I knew it wasn't really finished, so I, I went out and got more grapevine in the spring and then started weaving in and out and in and out and in and out of all that armature. And uh, that's, that became that random weave and, that, and then I decided it was finished at that point. And it's, it's large, but it's, it, it is surprisingly light. Um, it doesn't weigh that much. It probably weighs maybe five, six pounds. And it's just hanging from one picture hook. Um, because it is dried, it's uh, not as heavy as you might think. Karen, that's, that's Karen, uh, Karen is just asking, uh, when and how do you harvest grapevines? Do you dry and rehydrate? Every time I try to harvest, it just snaps. Oh, it, she's asking uh, that, sorry. Grapevines. Yeah, but her question, her question is when she's working with them, they dry, they snap? Um, no, every time I try to harvest, it just snaps. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mostly did that one f mostly fresh. So I harvested in the fall, did the, the fork armature, let that dry for an entire three, four months before I went back and harvested in the spring. And it, those were probably half dry when I wove, when I did the rest of the random weave. Uh, it was probably half dry. So the, so the grapevine was harvested and then it sat outside for a month and a half to two months, so it started shrinking a little bit. And it does, yeah, and it does occasionally snap. Depends on what you're asking the material to do. If I'm, if I'm trying to work the material and it keeps snapping and it keeps snapping, then I know it's not good for that project. And I either need to put it away and use it for something else, let it dry, maybe soak it and use it for something where I'm not asking so much of the material. Like if, if you're trying to wrap it around and around and around and it's snapping, then the material is not good for that project. So I'll, I'll try and pivot and see what else I can do with it. The, the grapevine was occasionally snapping for this, but because I'm not asking the material to do that much, I'm asking it to curve around and under and over. It wasn't too bad for that. Uh, the question as another question is can you do the same with clematis vine i have not used a lot of clematis it depends there's a bunch of different varieties um i mean the the, the short answer is yes just just experiment with it um the only clematis that i've been able to find around here is really thin but there's probably more varieties. Um, honeysuckle is another one you can use. Akibia is amazing. If anyone has Akibia growing where they live, make best friends with whoever's growing it. Uh, a lot of times it's actually invasive in the southern United States. Um, but Akibia is an incredible vine to work with. It's very flexible. Um, yeah, Wisteria, Akibia, Ivy, Honeysuckle, pretty much any long thin vine is game. I have a request for you to do a random weave demo on your YouTube channel Ooh. and uh, I can answer Karen because she said have you tried hops yet yes we have a driveway full of them <laughs> um, she said it's almost time to bring hers down yeah yeah I, I would say you know there the uh, bristles can be a little bit rough so you want to wear some gloves but uh, I've been trying to uh, get more hops and experiment with them. And again, it's, um, I find them a little bit thin, but I think something like what I wanted to do with this piece was have grapevine armature and then weave the hops in between. That's, I think that would have worked really well because I find the hops a little bit thin, but again, it depends on what you're doing with it. If you just want to make a, like a small random weave vessel with the hops, I think that would be beautiful. And Leave some of the hops flowers on them. That'd be great. And the key beer is also what you call chocolate vine, right? Chocolate vine. Yeah. 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 yeah it's amazing. Well, that it? Uh, we still have people joining, but uh, oh, but that's kind awesome. of, um, I think you're going to try and put this up uh, Yeah, afterwards. we're going to hit, we're going to hit save when we stop this and it's going to magically save it. And then I'm going to put it up, uh, probably, actually, I think I'll probably put it up on that YouTube channel, but since you're on Instagram, I'll put a link to uh, or maybe not a link but I'll put pieces of it up on the Instagram and uh, poke you over to the YouTube channel at some point so yeah and I think that's it I think we have to be 
like kind of eleven thirty ish was our was our wind up time. Have you seen Diana out there? Or is she? <laughs> or is she watching from? Karen says, "By we, she means you, Martin." <laughs> <laughs> Um, someone says one session tomorrow. Uh, no. <laughs> no. We have a day off tomorrow. <laughs> um, there's just lots of very nice comments which you'll be able to read after. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you so much for joining everyone. I wasn't sure if anyone would be interested. It means a lot to me to um, have people actually asking questions and interacting and watching. Thank you so much. Bye.